Welcome to PCR TV at Euro PCR 2019. My name is Eugenio Stabile from Napoli. I'm here together with Alexander Alansky from Yale. And we are going to discuss together about the recent PCR statement on the clinical outcomes after the use of drug coding balloon for peripheral interventions. Uh, so, Alexander, could you tell us about which is mainly which is the controversy about the use of drug coded balloon for peripheral interventions? Sure. So, um, up until December of 2018, that's what six months ago. Um, drug-coated balloons were really considered the standard of care in the treatment of SFA disease. And at that point, uh, there was a meta-analysis that was published that really challenged the uh, safety of drug-coated balloons in, for that indication. Um, this meta-analysis was published by Katsanos and colleagues. And essentially what they showed was that beyond one year, so at two years and four and five years, there was an increase, significant increase in mortality. Two years, it was a 68% increase mortality, and four to five years, it was a 93% increase in mortality. So they took this one step further, and they actually linked the increase in mortality with toxicity of paclitaxel. And that was based on a meta-regression from the meta-analysis, making a lot of assumptions and really sort of challenging the whole field. And since then, we have all been trying to, you know, understand this, to uh, better understand the data. The FDA, in fact, shortly after this publication, released a communication to the physicians in the U.S., warning physicians of the safety, potential safety concerns. They re released a statement that said that they would go and look into this further. And then in March, uh, so very shortly afterwards, there were two town hall meetings, uh, really think tan tanks, um, trying to again address and get the community together to address you know, this issue and, and better understand it. So in the second town hall, which was at CRT in March, FDA actually came out and said that in their own analysis of pre-market data, what they found was indeed that they saw a safety signal. That has not been published, but what they did was that they called for a town hall meeting, a panel meeting, uh, which is going to be held uh, in June, so mid-June. We have a full day, two-day meeting coming up, and hopefully at that particular point in time, we're going to see a patient-level pooled analysis from industry. So what we're hoping is that industry will come together and be able to pool all the data so that we can understand at a patient level what exactly is going on and clarify the, the, the controversy. <clears throat> Before that we wait for this uh, analysis to be done, in your opinion, do you identify a safety signal in this data or yeah. is it just a, a statistical find? Well, I think, you know, as for, first of all, the intention from Katsanos, the author, the first author of the uh, meta-analysis was very good. Uh, it is true that when you look at these um, studies individually, they're really looking at efficacy. They don't look at safety, they're not powered for safety. So I think his intent to try and pull all the data together at the trial level and address the safety concern, I think was very valid. Um, but as for any meta-analysis, inherent in meta-analyses, there are major problems in the methodology. And I think when you, know, you draw conclusions, you ha really have to understand what are the limitations. So when, I, when you review the meta-analysis, what you begin to see is that there's enormous dropout. So as you go from, there were 28 randomized clinical studies that were included at the beginning. Within two years, there were only 12. So more than half have dropped out. And at four and five years, there were only three trials. So, and, and 800 patients. So at the beginning, they started off with 4,600 patients. 
end up with 800 patients, which is less than 20% of the entire population. And then importantly, because we're talking about DCB here, importantly, in the four and five year follow-up, there was only 55% of those patients, the 800 patients, were actually DCB patients. Uh -huh. So that's even less. That's 12% of the long-term follow-up were actually DCB. So, and there are many other issues. As you know, when you, in, in the periphery, particularly as you go out to four and five years, the reintervention rate is extremely high. It can reach up to 45%. So clearly, in that time course, in the 45% of patients that go for reintervention, and that's going to impact the PTA group, the control group, more than the, the DCB group because we know the efficacy, you're going to get repeated exposure to paclitaxel. Well, that was never controlled for. The other thing is that we know acutely there's crossovers to stents. So if you look at the individual trials, the crossover to stent ha happens anywhere from 4 to 100% of cases. And again, some of those stents could have been paclitaxel stents. That was not controlled for. So there are many, many issues in the actual data that went into the meta-analysis that make the results really not, you know, not um, sound. And, I, and really challenge, I think, the, the conclusions of the, uh, the meta-analysis. As you well know, we have more and probably more uh, uh, detailed and uh, reliable data from the coronary field. That's right. And the use of paclitaxel in the coronary yeah. field. Yeah. Do you think that this kind of assumptions that came out from the meta-analysis can be switched to the coronary field? Or we really don't have yeah. data to speak about? Well, I, there is data. In fact, there was a, a patient-level pooled analysis that was presented here one year ago. Uh, this was DCB for treatment of instant restenosis in coronaries. It was close to 1,200 patients, so this was large. And there was no safety signal. So they looked, the main endpoint was death, MI, and stent thrombosis. There was no difference between the groups. This was compared to non-paclitaxel drug eluting stents. And in fact, DCBs did better. They, they were you know, superior to the stents. And in terms of mortality, there was no difference. There have been many, many meta-analyses in coronaries, and we've never seen uh, a, a safety signal there. So no, I don't believe in the coronaries. Understanding also that the dose of paclitaxel is much lower in the coronaries than they are in, in the periphery. But I don't think this has been, you know, this is not an issue in the coronaries. So you, you know that uh, in US there is a, um, a good control of uh, the device that, being used, that are normally used for interventions and Medicare is, is recording all the right. data concerning That's to the right. patients. So, the re we saw recently a publication on JAMA Cardiology about the two years outcome of the use of drug eluting technology yeah. for peripheral intervention. Do you think that once this follow-up will be prolonged and we have data up to five years, we can give an accurate um, answer to the hypothesis that was suggested by Katsanos? So just to back up, the, the CMS data that was published, I think, is another piece of the equation. And I think it helps us, gives us confidence that there is no mortality signal. So there were 16,500 patients in that analysis. Understanding these are based on DRGs, so you're collecting patients undergoing SFA intervention with paclitaxel versus no paclitaxel. They also looked at DCB versus PTA. And there was no mortality signal whatsoever, large sample size. What you have to understand in, in this type of analysis, it's all comers. It's, you know, everyday clinical practice. Mm. But in everyday, and, and of course, there can be some selection bias. So I think that while it certainly helps, uh, you know, sort of lower the temperature on this whole issue, um, it doesn't really address the question that is being raised. And I think to be able to address the question that's being raised, we do need randomized data. We need a randomized trial to be able to definitively address this. So which will be the next step? Should we ask people to pursue their intention in randomized yeah. trials yeah. in assessing so, this hypothesis? Yeah, so, so, you know, there have been 
first off, there have been f at least four patient-level pooled analyses driven by industry. So we've seen one with Lutonix, we've seen one with the Impact DCB from uh, Medtronic, we've seen one with the Stellarex device, none of these, and these are big, these are 1,200 patients up to 2,300 patients, none of these have shown a mortality signal. And the Medtronic analysis did a very elegant um, dose uh, analysis, looking at the mean dose between survivors and those who didn't survive. There was absolutely no difference. They looked at tertiles of dose, no, no mortality signal there. So already we've had you know, a tremendous effort to try and close the gap, improve the evidence that we have, and we're not seeing anything. You know, in the midst of all of this, of course, two big randomized clinical programs were put on hold here in Europe. One is the Basel III. This is a UK-based NIHR-funded uh, randomized clinical study, um, SFAs comparing DCB versus no DCB, um, and that was put on hold. The intention was to enroll 18, uh, 8, 860 patients. The other program, which is bigger and, I, and probably more definitive, is the SwedePad um, randomized programs. So there are two parallel randomized clinical studies in totality looking at 3,800 patients. And that trial was also put on hold. So our position from PCR in this statement is we acknowledge that, you know, while Katsano's meta-analysis does not give us sufficient evidence to suggest, you know, a, a safety problem, um, we can't ignore it. We can't just, you know, say this is nothing. We do have to, you know, look into this a little bit further. So the, the, the position is to certainly support doing a uh, industry-wide patient-level pooled analysis, which hopefully we'll see at the FDA panel next month. But importantly is to resume these two randomized clinical studies because they're big enough, and I think this may be our only opportunity actually to really put this you know, issue to rest and finally look at you know, the overall safety of DCBs and put that in context. And I think without the randomized data, we're, there's always gonna be a question. So I think it's really important for those two programs to continue and come to completion. So let's, let's come to the end of this yeah. talk. So uh, we need to wait for the, for the FDA town hall meeting. Yep. We need to wait for the publication of the patient level meta analysis. Yeah. And so we have statement also from the PCR. But your, which will be your advice for people that need to treat patients now? May yeah. we still use the drug eroding, te drug eroding technology to treat peripheral artery intervention? Yeah, I think, you know, currently we have very, very weak evidence of a problem. And I think in that context, um, you know, the recommendations are that we really shouldn't be changing clinical practice on the basis of a meta-analysis. We need more evidence, there's no question. And until we get more evidence that suggests that there is a problem, strong evidence to suggest that there is a mortality problem, I think physicians should continue their clinical practice. The, the PCR position is exactly that. Of course, you have to use your judgment, um, as you always do, but, but the, the consensus really is to, you know, not to alter clinical practice on the basis of this meta-analysis. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Alexander. You. Thank you.